morning. It's so great to see you all today. At least it's not raining. Oh, yeah. Oh, Gary started to say it. How about I'll say good morning, and then you could say. Good morning. Wasn't too bad. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for the rain that we've had and that it's not raining this morning as we come to be in each other's presence and join together to worship. Um, it's just awesome to be with you all today and good to be together. Can I pray and then we'll begin our time of worship together. Lord, you are so good and so kind and we are so grateful for the ways that we see your hand in all that we do everywhere we go. Even when sometimes things are happening that are struggles along the way, we see your hand at work and sometimes we might not see it immediately, but we we know you're there and we can see it later and look back and say, we praise you. We honor you. You're so good to us. We are so glad to be in your presence, to be together. And we ask God that you would take the words that are said, the songs that are sung, the scriptures that we read, all the ways that you can speak to us today, that we would listen, that we would hear that you would have your way among us today and teach us and help us to leave this place uh, closer to you, seeking you more as we go throughout our day and our week ahead. We love you and we honor you and we're so glad to be in your presence. In your precious name, amen. Would you stand with us as we worship together this morning? to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the may peoples the people praise, praise you, God. God. May, may all, all the peoples, peoples praise, praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule 
the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. Join me in this next verse. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest, God. Our God blesses us. And again, together, may God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him.
seated. And welcome everyone. I'm Pastor Gary and we're glad you're here today. A lot of exciting things happening here at Waynesburg Church of the Nazarene. Uh, tonight I'll be teaching a class in church membership. It's about the Church of the Nazarene if you're already a member, but you'd like to know more about the church. Tonight would be an excellent time to come, six o'clock in the pastor's office. And uh, if you're li- interested in church membership, I'd like to talk to you and we can arrange to take care of that. Next Sunday, is uh, we're honoring our graduates, high school and college, and we're even going to honor the little dudes that are coming up uh, into the uh, teen department. We're going to honor them too. But you have uh, the names of the graduates here. We have that for a reason. Uh, next Sunday, those high school graduates will have uh, little places uh, where you can see more about them, and you can also give them a card congratulating them, and so you have all the names here. One of those names is uh, Taylor Shriver. Do you know that Taylor Shriver, just this last week, won a gold medal at the state pole vaulting championship? In our midst, we have the number one woman's pole vaulter in the state of Pennsylvania. And next week, she'll be pole vaulting up to the altar. No, we won't ask her to do that, but that's, that's going to be great. But listen, we're gonna, it's going to be a big deal next, uh, next week to honor all of our graduates. Then the week after that, uh, we're we're having lunch together in the the gym. And um, everyone's invited to that. It's free, it's barbecue, and it's free. Now it's not Kansas City barbecue, but it'll be okay, it'll be okay. Let me just say it'll be okay. But everybody's invited to that, and it's free. So we hope that you'll put it on your calendar, plan to come, that's June 13th, right after the morning service, barbecue in the gym. The only thing is, you're going to have to buy your dessert, and you buy it by bidding on it. And they've got uh, 30 elaborate desserts that are going to be up for sale in an auction uh, on the 13th of June. You won't want to miss that, okay? I... There's so many cool things happening. On the 27th of June, by the way, that's my birthday. On the 27th of June, uh, we're going to join the churches all around the world in a service uh, on our screens. Uh, They'll be leading worship with the general superintendents of the Church of the Nazarene, music and everything. and And the prelude to that service will be our kids from Vacation Bible School, singing all their Vacation Bible School songs with us and for us on the 27th of June, by my birthday, on the 27th. And that's, that's going to be incredible. And I was going to save this, but just let me give you a little teaser. On the 4th of July, which is a Sunday, the week after my birthday, um, <laughs> on the 4th of July, we're going to have a cookout together. Now, I know that's a national holiday, and that's cool. Uh, But I tell you what we're celebrating on the 4th of July. Just this last week, we found out that the last payment on our mortgage was made. We no longer have a mortgage on our church. Now, that doesn't mean, okay, stop giving. (laughs) We still got repairs to do and air conditioners to fix and uh, stuff, you know, so there'll always be things around the building we need to fix, but that's an incredible, and we're going to celebrate that on the 4th of July with a cookout, uh, hot dogs, hamburgers, whatever, uh, SDMI is going to uh, help us with that, and, and uh, if you're here on the 4th of July, uh, all those fireworks that go on, that you think that's the nation's birthday, no, that's the burning of our mortgage. That's, that's what's going to happen on the 4th of July. So uh, it's a lot of cool things happening. Uh, tomorrow, the church office will be closed. Uh, it's a national holiday. Here's something about that that I 
think we want to remember. When I look back through history and consider all the sacrifices in every war, and I try to grasp it all, come to grips with it, stand in reverence of all those willing to give their lives for something bigger than themselves, I am stunned by the sheer numbers. All those lives, all those families, serving their country. I can't always comprehend it. My heart is not big enough to take it all in. That each one didn't come home. What they lost for their service. What we gained for their courage. Today, I stop to remember. Every single number is one soldier. One sailor who got up in the morning and put on a uniform. One Marine who answered the call to fight for freedom. One airman who knew the cost and went anyway. One man or woman who paid the ultimate price for many. And the freedom I live in now. Today, I remember.
me what pastor was the highlight of your ministry and I've had a, a lot of times when I just said it was good to be there maybe right up there at the top was um, a Nazarene youth conference on the campus of the University of Maryland summer of 1987 were you there it was a big one uh, in that conference, uh, we asked a worship leader 
Sherman Andrus. Sherman Andrus, um, for years, uh, sang, actually sang with the Imperial Quartet, then for a while sang with Terry Blackwood, traveled all over the country. Uh, Sherman is a little black dude, and when he sings, when he sings, he moves. He's got moves. And uh, he was great. He led worship that week. And one night, uh, Sherman asked me, as the director of the event, to come up and help him uh, lead a song. And uh, put a, a gold jacket on me, gave me a microphone, and I don't know what happened. It's like something possessed my body. <laughs> uh, he was moving, and I was moving, and... The two of us were moving together, and we were really moving, and people came up afterwards and said, well, you were dancing. And in those days, uh, dancing was kind of frowned upon by uh, church people, and certainly didn't want the leaders of their church dancing in front of 5,000 high school kids and youth leaders, and they said, uh, you were dancing up there on the stage. And they had it on videotape. <laughs> and uh, they sent it, uh, uh, sent the tape to the general superintendents of the Church of the Nazarene. Of course, they don't know dancing when they see it, so uh, <laughs> it really didn't make a whole lot of difference there. Uh, but they then sent it to the official dance committee of the church, which I'm pretty sure is in California, because... <laughs> That's where all the liberals are. So anyway, uh, that's, you know, in the meantime, I'm thinking, well, I'm going to lose my job. You know, I'm the director of youth ministries, and they got me on videotape dancing with a gold jacket, and, uh, and I'll probably lose my credentials, and I'm, uh, what am I going to do? And uh, before you take it any farther, you need to know that I was uh, clear, cleared of all charges. <laughs> Uh, because I had him on a technicality, this dance committee uh, defined dancing as coordinated movement. <laughs> and so th their ruling was, we don't know what he was doing on the stage. <laughs> but ever that was, it was not coordinated. Therefore, it cannot be dancing. But just in case... Um, they had brought me in. I had a scripture verse. And I was ready for them in my defense. It's the 30th Psalm, verse 11. Some of you know this verse. He turned my wailing into dancing. He removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy that my heart would sing to you and not be silent. Pretty good, huh? Folks, I would not insult you by telling you that's a verse about dancing. It is not about dancing. It's about being healed. And I don't plan to preach a message this morning about dancing. But I do want to preach a message about being healed. And so for that reason... I would like you to stand as I read. From Matthew, the 15th chapter, Matthew chapter 15, starting with verse 21. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from the, that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly. From demon possession. It's another way of saying she was a teenager. <laughs> Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him, Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right. For to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. 
Yes, Lord, she said. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. There are some problematic scriptures in the Bible. Uh, This is one of them, at least for me. Not not so much that Jesus had the ability to heal. I I, I know that he does, and I know that he did. Uh, But this little thing uh, about a Canaanite woman who was not a Jew, then she's a Canaanite woman, comes to Jesus and pleading for her, her, her daughter, wants her to be healed. And evidently, she's crying out to him. And to the point where the disciples are going, Jesus, you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to get rid of her. She's causing a disturbance here. She's messing up the ministry here. And she's, you've just, you've got to do something. And then the woman comes to, before Jesus, and she kneels. And she says to, to him, uh, Jesus, Jesus, you've got to help me. And Jesus says, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Oh, no, he didn't. Are are you telling me that he actually called a woman a dog? Jesus doesn't need me or anybody else to defend him or the words that he says. You would think that even in Jesus' day, this would be politically incorrect. Not a good move. But the truth is, what he said, everybody in the crowd understood. For, for a Jew, anybody else would be referred to as a dog. For a Jew, anybody else who worshipped any other god would be called a a dog. They got it. Everybody got it. And seemingly, even the woman understood it. But she came back with one incredible response. Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Now, I don't know if I've interpreted this right, but I think I'm pretty close when I say this. The reason why that little dialogue had to happen was because I'm pretty sure that Jesus wanted to make sure that that woman knew her place as far as being healed. It wasn't an entitlement. It wasn't I deserve to be healed. It wasn't that I that I deserve to be touched by God. It's the fact that I need God to touch me. I have nowhere else to go. I have no other hope. So she needed to understand where her place was, and she also needed to understand who she was talking to. Not just a good teacher. Not just someone passing by who might be able to do as a little special miracle. She was talking to the Son of God who had the ability to heal her daughter. So when that was set up, when, when those, those two things were understood, Jesus responds to her act of faith and says to her, I have not seen such great faith anywhere. Your request is granted. Reminds me of the words to a hymn. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. It's enough. It is enough. There's another 
I think, strange encounter, a different encounter. Of all the people that Jesus healed, this might be one of the strangest. You find it in Matthew chapter 9, verse 18. You find it in Mark chapter 5, 22. You find it in Luke chapter 8, verse 41. It's the woman with the issue of blood. You've probably heard the story. I'll have to confess, I've read it so many times, but often I would skip right over it thinking this. That sounds like a woman problem. That sounds like a medical problem that I don't want to deal with. I'll look at it, but I'm not going to study it. I don't want to really get close to that kind of intimacy. I don't want to get close to that kind of medical problem. And one day, the Holy Spirit said to me, you need to take a closer look. Here's how I understand the way it came down. Jesus was on his way to Jairus' house to heal his daughter. Jairus was an important public figure, a temple ruler. Everybody knew who Jairus was. And so when Jairus came to talk to Jesus about healing his daughter, I am sure a large crowd gathered to go to his house to watch Jesus do this miracle for his daughter. On the way to the house, this woman somehow sneaks in among the group of people to touch the robe of Jesus. The scriptures tell us that she had been sick for 12 years with this bleeding problem. Not all of the gospel accounts tell us that she spent all of her money on doctors. You know what gospel account didn't tell us about that? Luke the doctor didn't tell us about that. All the others say she spent, she spent all of her money on doctors and none of them were able to heal her. So she decides, as this crowd passes by, if I can just get close enough to touch the robe of Jesus uh, what, that he's wearing, if I can just touch the hem of his robe, maybe something good will happen. So she weaves her way among the large crowd. Again, on the way to Jairus' house, she gets up close to where he is. She touches the robe. And immediately Jesus stops and says, who touched me? I have to wonder. She had been sick for 12 years. She couldn't have waited any longer. And why does she choose to sneak a miracle out of Jesus? Everybody else confronted Jesus. Sometimes they would have their friends take them to him. Sometimes they, they'd have their friends go get him and bring Jesus to them. But this is the first account anywhere in Scripture where I can find where somebody tried to sneak a miracle out of Jesus. Why? Well, she was a woman. The silence is deafening. And that it was not a sexist statement. That was a social commentary statement. In those days, women had no power, had no clout. A woman could not confront a man, especially a man with the stature of Jesus. A woman wouldn't do that. So put yourself in her place. She had no more money, so she had nothing else to give. She's a woman, therefore she has no social stature. And she'd been sick for 12 years. What would you do? Would you confront him? No. So she weaves her way among the crowd, reaches out to touch the hem of his robe, and Jesus messes up the whole thing. Jesus stops and says, who touched me? Now, some of the gospel accounts don't tell us who did it. Some do. But it wouldn't surprise anybody to know it was Peter who said, who touched you? We're all touching you. We're all trying to get in the picture. 
We want to be there when you do the healing, Jesus. We're all pushing, shoving, crowding. We want to get close to you, Jesus. What do you mean? Who touched you? Everybody's touching you. But Jesus knew what he meant. And one scared woman knew what he meant. Can you see her going? Me. I did it. I touched you. And Jesus didn't say, well, lady, spending all your money, you'll be healed now. That's what, took, that's what did it. You got rid of your money. Because the truth is, the healing of Jesus does not depend on the amount of money you've given in the offering. He didn't say, woman, 12 years, good. That's the amount of time you have to wait, 12 years. Good. Because the truth is, it's not how long you've waited that has anything to do with the healing of Jesus. He didn't even say, woman, your cleverness to be able to get among the crowd, you even got right behind, right next to my disciples. Your cleverness to be able to get in here, that's what, because the truth is, your ability to keep whatever the problem is concealed to everyone else has very little to do with Jesus' ability to be able to heal you. He did say, woman, your faith has made you whole. And I don't like that. Oh, oh I understand it. I, I just don't like it. I, I don't like it because all of a sudden now I realize this is not just a woman problem. This is not even just a medical problem. It's a need to be healed problem. And as I look at my own life, I realize there's some things that have gone on even in my life that I've tried to keep concealed because I was too embarrassed for what I've done or what I've said. And time has gone on to the point where I have seen God do incredible things in people's lives. I've seen God heal people physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially. I've seen God do miraculous things, and I've heard their testimonies of how God has delivered them. And I would go, yes, that's great, but you don't know what I've done or said or experienced. And perhaps Satan's greatest lie is to tell you and me, you're not good enough for that. I mean, other people can pray and other people can be healed. Other people can experience the joy of those things, but uh, not you. This has gone on too long. It's gone too deep. And the things you've said or done or things that have been said or done to you are too bad to ever be healed. And so week after week, month after month, folks, maybe even year after year, God has healed others. He's not healed you. Good news. Really good news. He's still in the healing business. I believe he heals physically. I know he heals spiritually. I believe he even heals the emotions and the memories of things that have gone on in your life that have perpetuated your failures and hurts and pain far too long. And every time we think the Spirit is moving and believe that he is and he's touching others, Satan would say, well, no, not for you. And he's saying, but I'm here. And as he passes by, would you have enough faith just to touch him? This is Memorial Day weekend. I remember a 
a number of years ago. My dad had died in January, and now it was Memorial Day. I decided that I wanted to honor my father. So Chad, who I think was about three at the time, went with me and we drove by the floras, picked up a bouquet of flowers, and we drove out to the cemetery. Because it was Memorial Day weekend, there were veterans there who were giving flags uh, for veterans, and, and my dad was a veteran, World War II. So they gave a flag to my three-year-old son. He thought that was pretty cool. He said, put that on the grave of your granddad. Drove over to where my dad is buried. Uh, to be honest, I, I lost track of Chad. I was trying to get the flowers arranged, and there were a lot of people around there, and all of a sudden, I, I heard this blood-curdling, Woo! I looked around, and there was my three-year-old son running down the row of graves, taking care to step on every one of them, waving the American flag. Woo 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 woo! I was so embarrassed. I picked him up, I put him gently in the car. I put on my stern dad face. Chad, this is a cemetery. There are dead people here. And the relatives don't want you running and jumping and laughing and dancing on their grandparents. You know what I'm saying? And then I started laughing <laughs> when I realized how impossible it was to explain to a th three-year-old the concept of death. I mean, he's looking at me like, Dad, you brought me to a place with wide open spaces. You gave me an American flag. What am I supposed to do? I'm three. I run, I jump, I laugh, I dance. That's what I do. And then I thought, oh yeah. And God has called us to dance on the graves of things that Jesus 2,000 years ago died for. Dance on the graves of emotions and hurts and memories, to dance on the graves of, of physical pain, to, to, to dance on the graves of spiritual pain, to dance on the graves because Jesus came and died for those things. He turned our wailing into dancing. He removed our dead clothes and put a new suit of clothes on us called joy that our hearts would sing to him and not be silent. Here's the best news you're going to hear today, maybe all this week. Jesus is still in the healing business. And if you need that healing this morning, He's ready. He's here. Now, here's what I want to do. In a moment, we're going to pray for those who would like to be anointed. Maybe you'd like to be anointed for yourself, for whatever that would be. You don't have to tell me. God knows. Just tell me or the person anointing you, is this for you? Or is this for someone else? For you might like to be anointed for somebody you know that needs the healing touch of Jesus. If you want to be anointed when we stand, you can come and kneel here at the altar. If you'd rather not kneel, you can sit on the, one of the pews up here in front. We'll notice that you're here, and we will pray for you. And then there are some who would say, Pastor, I'm not ready for that. When you talk about the healing of memories, when you talk about the healing of hurts that have been done to you or you have done to someone else, I'm not ready to make a big deal out of that. I'm not one who would stand up and go, heal me. 
but you know in your heart because Satan reminds you every time we have church of your failure and of your pain. And so as we're anointing people up here in front, I want you just to take a quiet time to say, Lord, I'm reaching out today. I'm tired of being defeated. I'm tired of you telling me, of Satan telling me I'm not good enough to know the joy of Jesus in my life. And I'm going to claim victory. I'm going to dance on some graves today. At some point in your journey, you might be able to tell somebody. But I want you to know healing's available. Now, would you stand with me, please? And as Darla sings, if you would like to be anointed this morning for yourself or for someone else, I'd invite you to come to the altar or to the front of the church and I'd pray for you. No mountain, no valley, no gain or loss we know could keep us from
strengthen her. With me. Let you know the presence of Jesus in her life. That's there in full power. like this we don't tell God the how and the when of the healing we just trust him that he will do it and believe that he knows us better than we know ourselves he knows what we need he knows what to do he's big enough to take care of his children and if you're one who didn't really want to call out make a big deal but you know there's some emotions and some memories have gone on far too long and Satan has had that hold and you've let go of those things today you can claim that healing too he heals memories he heals memories and he's done it for you today now receive this blessing the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.